as I was thinking about what to talk about tonight and, and what scripture I, I think God left me or led me, didn't leave me, <laughs> he, uh, he led me to, to this scripture and I wanted to share it with you guys tonight. This is from Mark chapter 6 and he writes this. He says, Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. Everyone say they were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform these miracles? Now watch how fast amazement turns into something else. Look at verse 3. Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter. The son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and his sisters live right here among us. And they were what they were. Oh, come on. Say it with me. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. How many of you know we're living in an age of perpetual offense right now? We are living in the age of perpetual offense. It, we are quick to criticize. We are quick to condemn. We are quick to cancel. So tonight I want to preach a message I'm calling this, calling it honor in a cancel culture. Honor in a cancel culture. It, 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 it used to just be it used to just be that we would cancel like the crooked politician or we would cancel the athlete that had some kind of moral failure or the or the, the business leader but today it could be your kid's school teacher amen that puts one random thing on social media and then here come the trolls right and they have to face the, the wrath of uh, of that it doesn't take much it could be one misstatement one misunderstanding it could be a tweet from 10 years ago and we totally dismiss someone altogether. And you know what's crazy about this? It, it used to just be the, the rich and the famous, but now we do this with our family and friends. Uh, over these last 18 months with the political season and everything that went on in the world, <laughs> this happens with, with family and friends. That, that There are now family members who don't talk to each other because one voted for one candidate and one voted for the other. There's family members and friends who, who maybe they're still friends on Facebook, but you've unfollowed their post, amen? And, 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 and it's all because of, of who they follow on social media, or maybe it's just one single issue, and now you guys don't even talk. How many of you, be honest, how many of you have had a friend or family member or experienced this in your family in the last 18 months, where you've had some, some kind of riff or something that came up, and now these two people aren't even talking or getting along or barely talking, all because of something that, that happened? Here's, here's the truth. If you're continuously looking to be offended, you're always going to find what you're looking for. If you are always looking for the next offense, you're always going to find this. So tonight, I want to talk about how we have honor in a cancel culture because the way that Jesus has called you and I to live is very different than the way that our world lives right now. So let's pray and we'll jump into this. Hey, God, we, we love you. We thank you so much for the chance to be in your house tonight. We thank you that we live in the land of the free because of the brave. We thank you for those that have died to pave the way for these freedoms. We remember them. Father, we thank you for the way that you have blessed our country. We thank you for the way that we are able to disagree and even be disagreeable with each other. Father, I ask, that, though, that something change, that you light a spark within our country that, that unites us, that brings us back together, that, that allows us to put aside the differences and, and be one nation under God again. Father, that is our prayer. We thank you for the chance together tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said... Hey, wish three people happy Independence Day, and you guys can grab a seat. For those of you joining us online, happy Saturday night. Welcome to you, and uh, we hope you join us next Sunday. We're back to our normal schedule next Sunday, so we hope that you can be here live with us in the house. Everyone say, in the house, next Sunday. So in Romans chapter 12, in the Passion Translation, this is what the Apostle Paul writes. He says, be devoted to tenderly loving your fellow believers. As members of one family, trying to outdo yourselves in respect and honor of one another. I love this. Be devoted to tenderly loving your fellow believers. That's the people in here. As members of one family, trying to outdo yourselves in respect and honor of one another. Let me ask you a question. How are you doing with that? How, how, how are you doing with that? And now listen, I could get up here and I could talk about the culture all night long and guess how much that would change things. <laughs> yeah, absolutely zero. It would not change a thing. We could talk about everything and we could be all, yeah, and, and stupid culture, and, yeah, and, then, and then we leave and nothing changes. But here's what I want to ask and what I want to bring up tonight is how are we doing in this? How are we as followers of Jesus giving honor in a culture that refuses to show honor? 
Because here's what I believe. I believe that if we would do that, just the followers of Jesus, if we would begin to do that in this country, it would dramatically change the tone in our country today. That if just us, the believers, the followers of Jesus, if we would just learn how to do what this verse says, if we would learn how to devote ourselves to tenderly loving each other as one family and try to outdo ourselves in respect and honor, I believe that would dramatically change things. And even if you're not a big Bible person, you're still a little skeptical of all this, just think from a practical standpoint. How would our world be different? How would your office be different? How would your family be different? How would your marriage be different if we simply did what this verse said and we tried to honor the other people in your life above yourselves? Here's what I believe. I believe the level of depression in our country would begin to lift, and I believe we would find new purpose and meaning. Amen? I believe that would happen if just we, the followers of Jesus, would begin to do this. So I, I want to go back to Mark chapter 6, and I want to pull some takeaway truths out of this. Because if you look at the chapter before this, Jesus has just done some really, really cool things. Jesus had just healed this woman who had some sort of bleeding disorder for 12 years. For 12 years, she had this debilitating bleeding disorder, and Jesus had just healed her. And then, you know, everyone thought that was cool, and wow, Jesus, you're amazing. Well, then there was a little girl that actually died, like she was dead, dead, y'all. She was gone, okay? And Jesus came, and he spoke, and guess what happened? She's alive again. So Jesus had just healed a woman. He just brought a little girl back to life, and then he packs up his entourage, and he says, all right, boys, we're going to go to my hometown. Everyone say hometown. We're going to my hometown. We're going to my own stopping ground. So, so they go to Nazareth. Even though Jesus was born in Bethlehem, his hometown was Nazareth. This is where, where when, when Jesus was born and they fled, they went down to Egypt for a few years. Then when they, they came back, they came back and settled in Nazareth. That's where Joseph was from. And, and, and so, so they get back to, to, to Nazareth, and, and, and they're walking through the streets and everything, and people had heard the buzz about who Jesus was, and, and, and they, oh, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, and yeah, yeah, Jesus, and you, you mean like the, the carpenter? Yeah, yeah, no, no, he's been like teaching and doing, so, so he's coming into town, and there's all this buzz that Jesus is coming, and, and here's what's crazy, is they were looking for the Messiah, most of the people in Israel at this time, because of the oppression of the Romans, they were crying out to God, God, where is your promised one? Where is our deliverer? Where is our Messiah? And Jesus is coming into town literally as the Messiah, and they look right past him. <laughs> like they, they hear about the things he's been teaching and the miracles that have been happening, and they're all looking for the Messiah, and they look right past him. And instead of honoring Jesus, they actually do the complete opposite. So let's pull Mac, uh, uh, Mark 6 back up, and we'll, uh, we'll start in verse 2 this time. And it says this. It says, The next Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. Again, this is Nazareth, Nazareth his hometown. And many who heard him were amazed. And they asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Many of the people, this was the first time they had heard Jesus speak. And many of them were amazed. But there was another group of people, Jesus, you know, his hometown homies, that they were a little more skeptical of Jesus. They're like, 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 like where, where'd you get the power to do this, bro? Like, we went to high school together, okay? We went to Nazareth High School, right? You know, you know, home of the sheep. You know, we, 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 like, we were, we were on, you know, we varsity. We, so, so they're more skeptical, like, like, like seriously, where, where's this coming from? There's an undertone of doubt in their voices. And then finally, in verse 3, this is what happens. Then they scoffed, and they decided, you know what? Man, you're just the carpenter's son. You're the, the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon. And his sisters are right here among us. Here's what's so interesting, okay? If, if you're a, a Bible nerd, you'll appreciate this. Um, but in, in this text right here where they call Jesus the son of Mary, in this culture, in Jewish culture, it's a patriarchal culture, you would never refer to someone as the son of the, the mom, right? You would refer to someone as the son of the the dad, right? Well, who do they refer to Jesus as? The son of Mary. You know why? Because of the rumors that circulated his entire life. He's an illegitimate son. He, he ain't Joseph. Y'all heard? He ain't Joseph's kid. Oh, it was an angel. Yeah, okay, right? And so what they're doing is they're basically saying, hey, Jesus, you're an Ill like, don't you remember? You're, who, you're, you're illegitimate. So who are you to parade around as a rabbi and come walking into town? They were deeply offended, and they refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and among his relatives and his own family. 
Now, in just a moment, I'm going to show you why this is such a big deal. But I want to teach you guys a couple words that we see in this text right here. The first word is a timos. Everyone say a timos. A timos. This is where it says without honor, without honor. This is how we translate without honor. It's the word a timos. And what it means is it means common and ordinary. It means nothing to look at here. Nothing to value over here. It's just common. It's just ordinary. It's just average. Nothing to honor. Nothing to praise. Nothing to value. But, but then the other word I want to show you is the word time. This is the word that we translate as honor. So when Jesus says the word honor, he's talking about time. What does that mean? It means to value. It means to respect. It means to hold in high esteem. It means to treat as precious and weighty and valuable. So what does honor do? The difference between these two things are taking place in this scene. Well, honor, it esteems, it cherishes, it, it values, it encourages, it believes the best. Dishonor, on the other hand, it believes the worst, it belittles, it criticizes, it treats as common. So, so when we choose to, to, to honor, to, to teammate, when we choose to honor someone and value them, there are three things that we do, maybe you subconsciously don't know this, but there's three things that we do. We do these three things. We protect, we praise, and we prioritize what we value. When you honor something, you protect it, you praise it, and you prioritize it. Let me give you an example. When you get a brand new car, lucky for you, because you can't find them right now, right? <laughs> have you been by the dealerships lately? They have like three cars in the lot. It's like, hey, sir, let me show you my three cars. This is our selection, yes. Can I interest you in a 1997 Mazda? We have one of those over here. So you get a new car, new car smell. You guys ever had a new car, the new car smell? What do you do when you get a new car? You don't park that sucker on the front row. Where, where do you park that new car? Where do you park it? You park it in the back, right? Like you're, you're making your kids walk in the hot sun all the way across Walmart's parking lot because we're not parking up there when you get door dings. And then when your kids are in the car, do you let them eat? Oh, heck no, right? Like you're making them wipe their feet off before they get in. You're making space in the garage so you can pull the new car in the garage. And your wife's like, that's not fair. And you're like, I don't care. It's worth more than yours. I'm sorry. Anybody else? Okay, just me. So, so, so you, you, you what, what do you do? You, you protect it. You protect it. When you value, when you honor something, compliments and praise just flow naturally. You ever notice that? When you value someone, when you really value and hold someone in high esteem, don't you just naturally say good things about them? You don't have to, like, try, like, oh, there's that person that I really honor and value. Oh, what do I say nice about them? Oh, I can't think of, no, no, the, the compliments just flow because when you value someone, you, you naturally praise them. And then you prioritize what you value. People all the time, you and I, we're, we're guilty of this, right? We're guilty of this. We say, well, I don't have time for that. I just don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. And that's a lie because we have time for everything that we what? Prioritize, Right? And when you value something, when you honor it, you prioritize it and you make the time for it. So I'm just saying here, what would happen? Come on. What would happen if you and I, the people in our church, what if we decided to do this? And we began to honor each other and value the people here and began to, to protect and to praise and to prioritize. What would our church look like? What would your family look like? What would your school look like? Come on, come on. You want to have a life-giving marriage? Then, then, then you got to do some, some teammate, right? You got you to honor above yourself. You got to cherish. You got to treat as precious and weighty and valuable. You want to have an ordinary, lifeless marriage? Well, then just treat each other as ordinary and common. You know, a timos, right? Because what you once found as extraordinary, you will now see as ordinary when you begin to treat them as common. You see, when you value something, when you honor something, you are able to see the extraordinary in the ordinary. Because this is what happens to you and I. We're surrounded by all these people that are familiar and common to us. And because we see the same people, we're surrounded by the same people at work and in school and in our neighborhood. We treat them as common, as ordinary, and what happens? We dishonor them because we see them as just common and ordinary and not very special. We dishonor them in the way we speak to them. We dishonor them in the way that we treat them. But here's what I came to say to you tonight. If we could ever get our hearts and our minds around Genesis 126, that we are all made in the image of God, every single one of us. If we could ever get it through our heads that we've never seen someone, we've never locked eyes with someone that Jesus did not spill his blood for. If we could get that through our hearts and through our minds, then we would no longer see our wives as ordinary. We would see our wives as extraordinary, someone to value and hold high and to esteem. We would no longer see our children as just common and ordinary. We would see our, our children as full of potential in the hands of God. 
We would no longer see our, our, our boss as just some guy or some girl. We would see them as someone that Jesus died on the cross for. If we would begin to value each other as made in the image of God, someone that Jesus died for, if we could get the value, then maybe we could begin to return honor in a culture that does not give honor. But here's the problem, okay? This, that all sounds real great, right? Like, woohoo, okay. But here, here's where we live. Here's reality. Come on. It, reality is, is that when we see someone, we're like, when you become honorable, I'll give you honor. When you begin to behave honorably, then I'll ascribe honor to you. You keep behaving the way you're behaving, <laughs> I'm not going to honor you. But there's a huge difference between respect and honor. See, respect is something that has to be earned. Honor is something that's given. And we get those two things mixed up. Respect is something that has to be earned. That's based on behavior. Honor is something that we choose to do no matter what the person is or does. Honor is a humility of the heart where we say, God, because this is someone made in your image, someone that your son bled and died for, because of that, I'm going to choose to honor them and hold them above myself, even though they're not behaving honorably. I'm going to choose to do that because when I do that and treat them honorably, it's actually showing you that I honor you. And here's the crazy part about that, is that when someone who's not behaving honorably, you begin to treat them with honor and begin to value them and begin to encourage them and begin to build them up and begin to hold them in high esteem and you begin to speak those things over them, guess what happens? Nine times out of 10, they begin to behave more honorably. It's crazy. But you know what else is true? When, when, when you don't hold in high esteem and you don't honor and you criticize and you cut them off, off at the knees and you continue to, to, to bite and nip and scratch and, and just, what happens? They behave less honorably. It's crazy how that, that happens because honor builds and dishonor, it tears down. Let me tell you why this matters, okay? Let me, let me give you the, the why this matters. If you're a follower of Jesus tonight, here's why this matters to you, why it should matter to you. It's because anytime you show dishonor, Anytime you show dishonor, it actually hurts you. Anytime you show dishonor, wh whether it's to a boss or to a, a police officer or, or to a teacher or to your wife or your husband, anytime you show dishonor, you are actually hurting yourself as a follower of Jesus. Let me show you why. Uh, look back at in Mark chapter 6. So, so Jesus, he comes into his hometown. All his homeboys are like, bro, you're Mary's son. You're, you're common. You're ordinary. You're illegitimate. Who are you to come roll? And Jesus says that a prophet is without honor in his hometown. Now, now look at this. This is one of the most shocking verses in the entire Bible to me. In Mark 6, verse 5, he sa it says this. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and to heal them. And he was amazed, Jesus was, at their unbelief. Leave that verse up there for a second because th this will mess with your theology. You think you got God all figured out? <laughs> Exhibit A. So it's, it didn't say that, that, and Jesus wouldn't do any miracles. What does it say? It says that he, he couldn't do any miracles, that in this environment where there was no honor and there was no faith. Now, now, now could, could Jesus do miracles? Absolutely, because in the previous chapter, what did he have done? He had healed a woman that had been bleeding for 12 years, and he brought a little girl back to life. Jesus could do the miracles, okay? Miracles are not a problem. But then we get here in this environment of unbelief, and we get here in this environment of dishonor, and it says that he couldn't do many big miracles. Now, I'm not trying to get into a theological debate with you because I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I don't get paid enough to figure that out, okay? That's, 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 that's above my pay grade. But here's my point that I want to make to you. I think we all can say safely that Jesus didn't do some things that he would have done otherwise had there been honor. And that's my point that I hope you hear tonight. What miracles did God want to do in your life? What prayers did he want to answer? What blessings did God want to give you, but he didn't because you didn't honor him? Do you see why this matters? Do you say why this is, is such a big deal? If you haven't taken any notes tonight, I would encourage you to grab your service guide and write these next five things down. Because the Bible is very specific about where we should ascribe honor, where we should give honor. So if you haven't written anything out tonight, you should take some notes and write these things down. Because this is a big deal. 
If you were a follower of Jesus, and there are some things that maybe you've missed out on because you were not living a life of honor. You were not valuing people and showing them the respect and honor that they deserved. So there's some, some very specific things that Scripture says we should honor. And the first place that we have to begin is with God. That we are to honor God. We are to honor our creator, sustainer, El Shaddai, the, the provider, our, our, our holy one, the redeemer, the savior. That, that's God. That, that's who we honor. We bring him honor. How do we do that, though? Well, the Bible, again, is pretty specific about this. One of the first ways that we can honor God is with our wealth. In Proverbs 3, 9, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best parts of everything you produce. This is the principle of first fruits. That whenever you have any kind of increase in your life, then as an act of honor toward God and his goodness, we bring a percentage. In the Old Testament, that was 10%. We, 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 we bring that back to God as an act of honor. That because he is the sustainer of everything, he's the giver of everything, if you have some money, guess who gave that to you? God did. Because guess what? When you die, you don't get to take it with you. It's not your money. It's not your ability. It's not your talent. It all belongs to him, and he lets you have it on loan for a few years in this earth. And so when we have it as an act of honor because of his goodness and his blessing, then we, whenever we have an increase, we always, what, our first check, the first fruits, it goes back to him. You can honor God with your finances. And the way that you can honor God is with your body. Our, our, our body should be holy and set apart for Jesus. They should be holy and set apart. That means as a follower of Jesus, there's some things you don't do and some places you don't go. There's some things you don't watch and there's some things that you do do that seem weird to the rest of the world because we are set apart and we are called to be a holy people. You can honor God with your wealth. You can honor God with your body. You can also honor God with your worship. Come on. When we sing here on a well, Saturday night tonight, when we sing here corporately together, it's not just lip service. This is not just a, a, a service filler, like, hey, people are expecting the service to be one hour. Okay, let's put some songs in there. This is not just something that we put in. This is, this is an opportunity to worship and praise God for his goodness and his mercy and his love. In a culture that makes fun of God, we choose to honor the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, our Redeemer, our Savior, the one that, who forgives, the one that heals, the one that brought me up when I was down low. He brought me up and set me free from my sins and my guilt and my shame. He's, he, he's Jesus, and we honor him. He, he, Jesus said that these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. We live in a culture that gives God lip service. We give, live in a culture that, that treats God as ordinary and common. And I came tonight to tell you that, listen, God is not the big guy in the sky. Jesus is not your homeboy. Jesus is not six-pound, eight-ounce, little golden fleece diaper baby, okay? That's not who Jesus is. He is the Prince of Peace, the Lamb of God, the Alpha and Omega, the coming, conquering King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we choose to honor him because of how good he has been to us. We honor him above everything else. Scripture also says that we not just honor God, but we also honor people. We honor our spouse. We honor God and we honor our spouse. If you've been married for more than five years, just slip your hand up real quick for me. <laughs> been married longer than five years, okay. Then you know what I'm talking about here. You know what I'm talking about here. When, when, when you guys first got married, you listened to everything she said, didn't you? When you guys, first, when you were dating and you guys got engaged and you first got married, you hung on her every word. Now, it's like you can't even mute Sports Center so she can tell you about her day, right? It's like, baby, I'm watching this, all right? Come on, tell me. Uh, come on, men. You've been tempted to take the remote and see if the mute button works on her, right? Come on, come on. She's talking your ear off. Talk, you're like, come on, I just, I just missed the highlight. <laughs> And so when we started out the relationship, we treated each other with honor and value, and they were someone to be esteemed and, and, and precious and important. And now, after a few years go by, they're just kind of common, and they're just kind of ordinary and familiar. And, and listen, showing dishonor is not like cussing someone out. It's, it, it's not running someone's name through the mud. You know what dishonor is? Dishonor is simply not doing the things you used to do. Dishonor is not doing the things that hold them and, and, and value and, and, and hold them high. Honor elevates, dishonor decimates. Two verses mashed together. 1 Peter 3, 7 and Ephesians 5, 33. You husbands must be careful of your wives, being thoughtful of their needs and doing what? Honoring them. And then Ephesians. And the wife must see to it that she deeply respects her husband, obeying, praising, and doing what? 
honoring him. How much different would things be if we simply did the things this verse talks about? Come on, you want to have an amazing marriage? Then figure out how to out-honor each other. Figure out how to out-love each other. Figure out how to out-encourage and esteem and give. And and figure out how to outdo each other. Because as you show honor to them, you're actually showing honor to your Heavenly Father. So we honor God. We honor people, beginning with our spouse. And then we also honor other people like this. We honor our parents. Write that down. We honor our parents. If we have any, uh, any students in the house tonight, I want you to, to hear this. I know you think your parents are weird, and that's because they are. <laughs> it's because they are weird. But here's what I want you to hear tonight is this. Your parents are not called to be your buddy. Your parents are called to be spiritual authority that imparts life into you. And one of their jobs as a parent is to teach you how to honor in the home so that when one day, when you're 18, 19, 20, 29, whatever, when they finally leave the home, they know how to honor other people. That's your parents' job, is to teach you how to honor them so that you know how to honor other people. In Exodus 20, God's giving the Ten Commandments to Moses, and he says this. He says, honor your father and mother, then you will live a, (laughs) this is amazing. You want to live a long life? You want to live a full life? This is the secret right here. It's not the fountain of youth. It's not in St. Augustine. It's right here. Honor your father and mother. You guys ever been there? Found you. Isn't that the most awful place in the world? It smells like, well, we won't talk about what it smells like. <laughs> Honor your father and mother, side note. Then you will live a long, full life in the land of the Lord your God has given you. The first commandment with a promise to it. Honor equals life. Turn, three, turn to three people and tell them honor equals life. Honor equals life. Honor equals life. So parents, listen up. This is our job. Parents, this is our job is that we are to create a culture of honor in our house that our children know that we honor those that have gone before us and those that are over us. Those that have gone before us and those that are over us. Because if you think your kids are going to honor their boss one day when they didn't even honor you in your own house, you're delusional. You are not your kid's buddy. And when you choose to not force them in some situations to show you honor, You're robbing them of the opportunity of the blessing of knowing how to give honor later on in life. God says we honor him, we honor our spouse, we honor our parents. And then the fourth area that scripture says very clearly is we honor those in authority. Write that down. We honor those in authority. (laughs) How counterculture is this one right here? We honor those in authority. I can hear some of you in your heads right now. There is no way I am honoring the current president. 81 million votes. Yeah, right. And then the other half of you in the room, you spent the last four years doing your best to dishonor the last president. And the Apostle Paul comes along and he gives us a command. This isn't a suggestion. This is a command. He says to us, everyone must submit. Oh, now you did it, Paul. Everyone must submit to, this can't be right. Is this the right translation? I don't think it is. Everyone must submit to governing authorities for the... For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Hmm. Let's get real for a second, okay? There have been some leaders in our country that I have liked, and there have been some leaders in our country that I have disliked. There have been some leaders in our country that have liked their policies, and there have been some leaders in our country that I have been opposed passionately to their policies. But I dare you to find me a single second when from this stage I dishonored any of them. Or scroll through my social media and see if there's ever been a moment where I dishonored an elected official. Because this is what we've lost in our culture today. You can disagree with someone without dishonoring them. And that's what we've lost. You can disagree. Yes, we can disagree. I disagree with a lot of politicians, but I can still pray for them. I can pray for the ones that I voted for, (laughs) and I can pray for the ones I didn't vote for. Praying for the ones you voted for, Jesus is like, ooh, impress me. You voted for them. You literally voted for this, for this to happen, okay? If you don't like it, you voted for it. Pray for the ones that you didn't vote for. Oh, come on. (laughs) Yeah. You can disagree without showing dishonor. You're like, well, show me this in the Bible. Okay, Uh, King David. 
he, before he was King David, he was just ordinary shepherd boy David. He was anointed to be the next king of Israel, but there was one problem. There was still a king of Israel. His name was Saul. When Saul learned of this, he got really jealous of David and tried to actually kill David. David goes on the run, and even though the king was trying to kill him, he still showed honor because this was the person that God had put above him at that time. In fact, there's one incident where, where David had the opportunity to take Saul's life in a cave when he's going to the bathroom. It's in the Bible. You should read it. David just goes and cuts off a little bit of his robe, and then he feels bad about that. You know why he felt bad about it? Because this is God's anointed, and how dare I put a hand on God's anointed. Now listen to me. Has the president ever tried to kill you? I, I didn't hear an answer to that. Has the president ever tried to kill you? No. So if David can show honor to the person trying to kill him, then I bet God expects us to show honor to the person that's not even trying to kill us, okay? That, that, that we can do better than we've been doing. Then the mudsling, as a follower of Jesus, we're better than that. We're better than all of the name-calling and mudslinging and all the dishonor that we see. As a follower of Jesus, we're better than that, and we're called to be better than that. So we honor God, we honor our spouse, our parents, people in positions of authority. That includes bosses. Hmm. <laughs> That includes teachers. That includes the police. Yeah, that includes the police because God put them there. And one more I want to give you tonight is this. We honor those who are spiritual leaders. We honor spiritual leaders. We have to honor the pastors and the spiritual leaders that are over us. And I don't want this to sound self-serving, so I'm going to deflect right here. But Scripture says that, that our spiritual leaders are worthy of double honor. And so to all of our lead team, to all of our lay pastors, to all of our volunteers, to all of the volunteers over in kids right now, taking care of your kids, they deserve double honor, amen? Double honor. What they do matters to me, and it matters to our Heavenly Father. 1 Timothy 5.17 says this. It says, the pastors who lead the church well should be paid well. They should receive double honor. There it is, double honor for faithfully preaching and teaching the revelation of God's word. So let me get extremely honest with you guys. And I hope you receive what I'm about to say within the context of the way I intended it to be said. Whether that happens, I don't know. But here's one of the most disturbing things to me coming out of this whole COVID nightmare. is the number of people that claim to be followers of Jesus today, but they no longer prioritize the gathering of his body, of his church, of his people. As we've gone through this, there's been something where people genuinely believe in Jesus and they're followers of Jesus and they want to serve him, but they do not value his bride. And they do not prioritize his bride. And they don't make time for his bride. Listen to me, if you don't make time for my wife, if you blow my wife off, you ain't my friend. But yet so many in Christianity today, I feel like that's where we're at because we can, just watch a, we can just watch a video online and we can put on a worship playlist and we can have church all by ourselves. And I feel like that's the equivalent of the people in Jesus' hometown. That they kind of had this attitude of, well, bless me if you can, Jesus. Bless me if you can. And I think the danger is that when we don't prioritize the gathering of his people, when we don't prioritize his bride, the church, I, I, I think we miss out on what Jesus wants to do. I think we miss out on the miracles. I think we miss out on the healing. I think we miss out on what he's accomplishing in the world. I believe that. And we come in with the attitude of, well, you know what? I didn't like those songs today. I didn't get much out of that message. He sure was screaming a whole lot. Didn't really connect with anybody today. I guess I better find another church. Well, maybe the reason that the church didn't work for you, bro, is because you didn't put anything into it. You got out of it what you put into it. You see, the level of value that you receive is in direct proportion to the amount of honor that you give. The amount of value that you receive is in proportion to the amount of honor that you give. People sometimes after the service will come to me and like, oh, Pastor Brian, that was one of the best messages I've ever heard. And I'm like, no, it's not. You just listen better. Yeah, no, no, no. You came in and you expected something from God. You expected to meet God. You expected there to be a word from God for you today. And you listened better and you leaned in and you held this time in high esteem and you prioritized it and you gave God the honor that was due. And what did he do? He worked in your life. And that principle was true in any aspect of life, not just the church. 
Anytime you walk into a classroom, anytime you walk into an office room, anytime you walk anywhere into your family, you have the opportunity to honor the people that are there. If tonight you're kind of feeling like, you know what, Pastor Brian, you know, I'm just not feeling the love right now. I'm just not feeling like anybody loves me. I'm not feeling like anybody values me. I, listen, I, I say this in love to you, and I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm not trying to get confrontational. But if that's how you feel tonight, then maybe you should look in the mirror first. Because the amount of value you receive is tied into the amount of honor that you give out. You're like, well, Pastor Brian, you don't know what it's like to live with them. You don't know what it's like to be married to them. They're wrong. They're the ones that's difficult. They're, why should I do this? Because, they, listen, you know why you do it? It's because his name is on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, his name is on them. That's why you do it, because, because they need the same grace that you needed. They need the same grace that I needed. They need Jesus just as much as I need Jesus. Because his name is on them, that's why you show them honor. That's why you do it. And that's what I hope you get out of this tonight, is that you are not common, and you are not ordinary, and you are not average, because his name is on you. And when his name is on you, you now have value. I appreciate that. Let me, let me, let me show you what I'm talking about here. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. Um, uh, Babe Ruth, the great Bambino. He was known as one of the greatest home run hitters of all times. I don't think anyone would debate that. One of the greatest home run hitters of all, all times. He autographed dozens and dozens and hundreds of baseballs. But did you know this? He only ever autographed seven home run bats. Only seven home run bats that we know of are in existence. I want to show you something tonight that you may have a hard time believing. Let me get it out of the case. This right here is one of those bats. You see his signature right there. I'm just kidding. This was $12.99 on eBay. <laughs> It'd be a lot cooler if it was real, but no, this is, this is a replica signature right there. Replica signature. But there are only seven home run bats that he actually autographed. And get this, one of the seven bats went missing for decades. Until 1988, when there was a gentleman who was dying, he was sick, he's on his deathbed. He had a nurse that came in and took care of him because he had no family, he had no loved ones, he had no friends. And so this nurse came in, and this nurse, she looked after this man in his final hours, and she, she loved him, she honored him, she, he, she took care of him. And because of that, near the end, he gave his autographed, Babe Ruth bat to her as a token of his appreciation. Her name was Marcia, and she had no clue what she had been given. So she put it under her bed for the next 18 years. She took one of seven autographed Babe Ruth home run bats, and she stuck it under her bed for the next 18 years. Finally, Marcia, she ended the end of her nursing career, and she decided that she wanted to open a restaurant because that was her dream, but she did not have the money. She did not have the capital to be able to open a restaurant. So one day on a whim, she thought to herself, I wonder if that nasty old bat, I wonder if that thing's actually worth anything. And so she went down to a local memorabilia store. Mem I can't say that. Memorab Can someone say that for me? That word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pawn shop. There you go. <laughs> she went down to that place, and they had it verified, and it turns out it was the missing one of seven autographed Babe Ruth home run bats. In 2006, she auctioned the bat off. You ready for this? $1.3 million. This one was $12.99 plus shipping and handling off of eBay. Because that signature right there is a replica. But if his name had been on it, it would be very valuable, wouldn't it? So she, she took the bat, she auctioned it off, she got the $1.3 million. She opened up her restaurant, but guess what she did with a significant portion of the money? She donated it to a charity that Babe Ruth had always been fond of. And now the reporters and the media was like, they're beside themselves. Like, are you crazy? Like, this, you, you, just, you just, like, hit the lottery, $1.3 million, and you give, like, half of it away to some charity? This is what she told the media. She says, the bat was only valuable because Babe Ruth's name was on it. Since he made it valuable... 
the only reasonable thing I could do was something that would honor his life. What makes you valuable? What makes me valuable? It's whose name is on you. And his name is? Come on, his name is? His name is? And because his name is on you, you have value and you are not ordinary. You are extremely important to the king. And so because of the value that you have, this is what we can do. Because of what has been done for you, because his name is on you, we can do what Marcia said. That we can do something that would honor his life. You know how you honor Jesus' life? By honoring the people around you. By holding the people around you in high esteem, higher than even yourself. And if you recognize tonight that, you know what, Pastor Brian, I have not been living in honor. I have not been honoring the people around me. I want to encourage you right now in this moment, in your heart, to just repent. And just say, God, you know what, I've not been showing honor. I am so sorry because I realize that when I show dishonor to people, I'm actually showing dishonor to you. I encourage you just to repent of that. Because here's what I declare tonight as the spiritual leader of this house. I declare honor over this house. I declare honor over your family. I declare honor over our church family, that wherever we go, we would be known as people of honor, that when we speak as a church, we speak words of healing and words of life, that we would do whatever we had to do to fight to remain unified because we realize that we can do infinitely more together than we ever could separately. I declare honor over your families. I declare honor over your homes. I declare honor over your children because of Jesus and his name and what he has done. Pray with me. God, we we honor you this evening. We set aside this time, whether it's a Saturday or a Sunday, we set aside this time to show you honor. And so, Jesus, we honor you. We honor you for your sacrifice. We honor you for coming and bleeding and dying to take our place, to die for our sins, to give us new life, to give us new hope, to give us a future, to give us a forever eternity with you. Jesus, we honor you tonight. You are the one that is above all others. Yours is the name above every name, at which every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. We confess that you are Lord tonight. You are Lord in this place. You are Lord of this house. You are Lord of our lives. Jesus, I ask that that you do something, even though we (laughs) we are few compared to the number of people in this country. We are few compared to the number of people in this county. Father, I pray that you do something that's, that you spark something here that radiates out all over. That you spark something in our country. That you restore honor to our national conversation. That you restore honor to our leaders with each other. May we honor those in authority over us, whether we like them or not. And as we do that, may people wonder what's different about us and may we be able to point them to you, point them to the King of Kings, point them to Jesus and say, this is why we do it. This is why we show honor when there is dishonor. We show honor because Jesus died for us. He chose to honor us above himself. And because he was brought down low, God raised him up high. May we be able to point people to that Jesus because of the honor they see in our lives. Father, I pray for marriages. I pray for honor to break out in marriages all over this place. May we honor our spouses. May we put their needs and wants and wishes above our own. May we honor our children. May we raise our children, or honor our parents. May we raise our children up in an environment that, that teaches them how to honor authority. And so they know how to honor their heavenly father. Father, I thank you for the honor that you have in this house and for the way that we honor the people that are above us, the ones that care for our kids, the ones that serve us week in and week out. I thank you for the leaders of this church. May they feel double honor tonight. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for our country, and we ask that you bless that you bless this nation once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen.